Can I talk about water really quickly? Because It was one of the most highly anticipated moments of the year in Arizona politics. What, if anything, did Arizona voters learn from last week's U.S. Senate debate? Life in a swing state. All of the major presidential contenders and their supporters returned to Arizona. What'd they say and will it make a difference? One of the most pivotal house races in the country is playing out in Southern Arizona. Who won and who lost their high stakes debate? Now on Politics Unplugged. Good evening, I'm political editor Dennis Welch. This is Politics Unplugged. This week we saw the only scheduled debate for the Arizona Senate race. Ruben Gallego and Kerry Lake faced off for about an hour uh, with more than half of that time dedicated to immigration. Here to break it all down is Democratic consultant Adam Kinsey and Republican Chip Scutari. Thank you, gentlemen, for both. Let's start with you, um, Chip. What was your general impressions, your takeaways from this evening? I mean, people like to look at these debates as who won, who lost. What, how, how are you looking at this debate? Well, each candidate had different motivations, obviously. For uh, Ruben Gallego, Congressman Gallego, his was do no harm. Mm -hmm. You know, stay calm, don't let uh, Carrie Lake get under her skin. For, for Ms. Lake, it was be combative, uh, be loud, mm -hmm. um, talk about the border, which the moderators did for probably about the thir first 35 minutes of the debate. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought the one viral moment that could be cut into an ad is at the very end when Carrie Lake says, I have not lied to the people of Arizona. And within about 30 seconds, Maricopa County recorder Stephen Richer had tweeted out, yes, you lied and you admitted in court, and here's a court document. <laughs> so I think that's the one viral moment. Other than that, I don't think it's going to move the needle much for either candidate. Yeah, and we're going we're to play that soundbite here in Cut. just a minute. But, yeah, that was certainly <laughs> one of the moments in the debate. What was your takeaway from this? I mean, if, if, if being loud and being outrageous were actually objectives, then she accomplished those. Mm -hmm. I think that running five to ten points behind Congressman Gallego, her objective was to win some new voters. Mm -hmm. And on that count, she failed miserably. The problem with, with the Carrie Lake campaign in general, and you saw it play out with the debate in particular, was she needs to expand her base. You know, Trump can get up there and say lie after lie, objection, objectively false, easily demonstrably false things, and his base isn't going anywhere, but his base is large enough now that it's still a coin flip in every in every uh, in every poll. Lake is 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 needing to to expand though, and you're not going to expand by just lying uh, time and time again. She said that you know uh, that Katie Hobbs signed the 15-week abortion ban, absolutely easily proven to be a false statement. She said that the housing crisis is due to undocumented immigrants uh, buying up all the homes. That's uh, obviously false. So she just said time and time again, and, and she went for NASA. She went for loud and unhinged, and she accomplished those objectives, but she didn't get a single new vote, and she's uh, in desperate need of them. Yeah. I was going to say, if you don't follow politics and you watch Carrie Lake, you see a polished broadcaster yeah. Yeah. who's well lit, very articulate, makes your points. But then when she won't admit that she lost the 2022 governor's race, I don't know if the undecided voters or people who are not paying attention say, wow, like, what's going on with this lady? Like, really, like, I, I don't know if pe people, she wants people to call her governor elect, 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 governor elect, elect Lake, but that is a little crazy to yeah, a lot I mean, of people. I mean, beyond the, 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 and we'll get into more to the substance, but the performative aspect of this, I, you know, I have heard uh, people say that they thought if you were just looking at this, that uh, Carrie Lake looked more senatorial, looked more in control on that. That's... <laughs> three decades of TV experience in front of yeah. cameras probably playing out because Ruben did look a little unsure, of, a, 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 a little bit unsure of himself in the beginning of that debate. I think, you know, the, the congressman's objective was to not swing at the pitches in the dirt mm -hmm. that she kept throwing, mm -hmm. and he did that. I think he looked like a statesman. Mm -hmm. She looked like a lunatic. Uh, and, and that's not the first time. So I, I you know, I don't know who you're talking to that, 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 is, that is giving you that, Dennis, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I have to, you know, disagree. I would say Congressman Gallego, much like Governor Walsh in the vice presidential mm -hmm. debate, you could tell he probably has not done a lot of debates. Mm -hmm. So I think at first he was a little nervous. And then as the debate kept going, he, he found his way and got more affirmative. Um, but I think he's probably, probably some nerves at the beginning of the debate. And, and he, he let her, and the moderator sure as heck did too, let her just inter interrupt and, and, and go off, uh, you know, unfettered. And 
I think that was a good choice, actually, because mm -hmm. she wasn't saying anything that, that undecided voters or moderates wanted to hear. She's just, you know, repeating her lunacy time and time again. So I think the congressman just stood back and said, you know, the floor is yours. <laughs> and it, it really worked for him. And, and it, uh, you know, she shot herself in the foot again. OK, let's uh, get some uh, reaction from you guys about some of the policy discussions and, and disagreements they had. Obviously, let's start with that immigration debate you mentioned earlier. It was over nearly half of this debate was taken up on this issue, and here's one of the exchanges they had this past. I don't think we can do enough to secure our border. It is the most important issue facing Arizonans and facing our whole country. Every state is a border state right now because of this man's policies, this man's votes, which have been 100% open border. He sided with the cartels every step of the way and against the American people. In my time in Congress, I have voted and brought thousands of border patrol agents to Arizona, have voted and funded hundreds of miles of border walls where needed, where our experts wanted it. This is why I'm supportive of the border uh, uh, enforcement bill, uh, the compromise bill that was supported by Border Patrol and Carrie Lake for still no reason how, why she can explain it. She can't explain it why she was against that bill. What's your thoughts on the Arizona voters we've seen in poll after poll want something done with the border. They want it secure. Carrie Lake is much more hawkish when it comes to border issues. Ruben um, in the past has been critical of building border wall and whatnot. How does this come off with voters on this issue? You know, this is definitely Carrie Lake's sweet spot and it's the uh, MAGA basis sweet spot for immigration and border security. Um, the problem with these debates is and it's nobody's fault. When you, it, context gets lost in two minutes. You can't explain what's real, what's not. You know, she said some outlandish things about the evasion at the border. Um, I think if you look at the stats, um, the immigration statistics are getting better now, a lot better than compared to 2020. Um, but some of that truth gets lost in the shuffle of the debate and the, the belligerent back and forth. Yeah, and we do know uh, over the past four years, we did see record numbers of migrants crossing the border. It has uh, drastically uh, reduced, uh, been reduced since June, since uh, the Biden administration issued that executive order. Want to get your take uh, from that exchange on, on immigration. Well, and the, part, the part that wasn't included in that clip was Kerry Lake saying the border was secure under President Trump. Are you kidding me? In 2019, we had 850,000 documented cases of undocumented immigrants coming over the border. So, um, uh, you know, she... What she said, again, like the rest of the debate, really played well to this very narrow group of folks, but she didn't say anything that was going to help. You know, Congressman Gallego is able to talk about the very specific times that he, you know, specific instances where he does support border wall construction, for instance, the times that he has voted uh, for, um, uh, for more uh, law enforcement personnel on the border. And this bipartisan border security deal is the biggest death nail for the Kerry Lake campaign. And, and folks like Juan Siscomani, who are trying to, you know, brand themselves as, as these deal makers, and they flatly refused to support this law simply because Donald Trump said, I don't want the issue, I want the policy. And Rubin did a great job, Congressman Gallego did a great job of explaining how we were bargaining with them. I was giving them border wall in exchange for protections from dreamers. Carrie Lake interjects and says, no, you, no, mm -hmm. you didn't, that's a lie. Well, I was in the room, Carrie, sorry. That was a pretty good, pretty good end of that thread for, uh, for Rubin, I thought. The okay. one name that wasn't mentioned was our senior senator, Kirsten Sinema, <laughs> who worked pretty hard, whether you like or sure. not, on that bipartisan and border bill. And it, so it was know. a bit ironic yeah. that uh, her, her bill is, is central to this campaign yeah. and a lot of politics, including the presidential campaign, actually, at this point. Yep. Let's, let's move on. Let's talk. Uh, show this little clip, this clip we had about abortion. Another key issue uh, in this race. Here's what they had to say. She said she was thrilled when Roe was overturned. And then when she was disappointed to find out that the 1864 law, again, the one that had no exceptions for rape or instance, was not going to get enforced. She said, well, I hope the sheriffs will do their jobs. Can you imagine? It's not true. Sheriff, we have it on tape. You, these are all your words on tape. He knows, and Steve, you know this as well. We're running for federal office. This isn't going to be cited, decided in the Senate. This is not. And I will tell you this. I will never pass a federal abortion ban, nor will I approve or vote for federal tax dollars being used for abortion. Get your take on that exchange. Obviously, abortion, key issue. In this race, Carrie Lake has had, uh, you know, an evolving position on this, and it seems to be one of those issues that is hurting her campaign. 
it's crushing her campaign, and she's not the only one. I, I'll use Siskamani as another good example. So these folks are trying to remake themselves after they cheered the downfall of Roe, and they have done things like, in Siskamani's case, voted for abortion restrictions, uh, and they are trying to, they, they, they can read a poll as good as anybody, and they know how far away from public opinion they are on this. So they're trying to remake themselves, and it's not working. Do you think uh, people are buying what Kerry is saying on this issue now? No, I don't. And I think, you know, when Roe v. Wade was overturned, it, you know, it was celebrated at the time by the pro-life movement, mm -hmm. and rightfully so, they believe that. But I think it's been a very devastating for the Republican Party up and down the ticket all across the nation mm -hmm. because reproductive rights now, this issue has totally flipped on its head, and it's it's so positive for Democrats. All right, and final soundbite here. I know we're running out of time, but we got to get that. You mentioned this uh, piece, this, sound, this clip earlier. This is uh, Carrie Lake and Ruben Gallego uh, interacting there with Ruben trying to press Lake on the past election and whether or not she would concede that she lost the 2022 gubernatorial race. He's still in denial about okay. the 2022 election. And now I give you one minute. You have one minute. Will you finally tell the people of Arizona did you win or lose that election? Can, can we? Can I talk about water really quickly? Because I'm going to give I, you I 30 we seconds water. to respond. And please talk about water. This seems like this is not an issue that uh, the campaign wants to talk about. Afterwards, the you know uh, the, the the candidates were invited to speak with the media. Um, Ruben Gallego came in. He to only took four questions. Uh, Carrie Lake did not come into the media room. She sent some surrogates there, and they did not answer the question on the 2022 election. This it's it's interesting that they want to avoid this. This was she, uh, she sent Charlie Kirk. I mean, uh, it's it's it would be hilarious if it weren't so awful. Um, Here's the, here's the problem. Carrie Lake knows she's going to lose. Uh, she's got a gubernatorial re-election to think about, and she's got to get reinvited to all the turning point, you know, revivals. Uh, and that's what her focus is. Um, she cannot admit that the big lie is a big lie and that she's um, uh, very much a part of it uh, because that's her brand. So while she knows that, uh, that you know, being a liar doesn't pull well, uh, she's not going to change uh, because that would just change her brand too much. And real quick, final word here. This, honestly, it's such a basic ideal. Just admit you lost the election. This all stems from former President Donald Trump not being able to admit he lost the 2020 presidential mm -hmm. race to Joe Biden, and he spurned this uh, tsunami of election deniers and Kerry Lakes in that camp. All right, we're going to end it right there. And still ahead, Arizona was a political hotspot this week with a flurry of visits from presidential candidates and their running mates. We'll talk about that when Politics Unplugged continues. Welcome back to Politics Unplugged. Arizona has been a big focus for the presidential campaigns this week. Vice president, presidential candidates Tim Walls and J.D. Vance were both in the Valley earlier this week with Donald Trump and Kamala Harris visiting later in the week. And here to talk about that, Republican political consultant Barrett Marson and Democrat Stacey Pearson. Thank you both for being here. Let's start with you with, yes. the, with, the, with the key question here. We saw, we saw Kamala Harris was here. She's making a couple of stops. Uh, she was down in Chandler uh, talking about a host of issues that are important to Arizona, including housing, obviously yeah. a very important issue here. But when you start looking at the national polls, you start looking at the polls in Arizona, everything is razor thin. Everything is a statistical dead heat. Is she wasting time coming to Arizona because Democrats Remember 2016 very well, and people were critical of Hillary Clinton then spending too much time in Arizona instead of paying attention to states like Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and whatnot. Oh, she can walk and chew gum, right? She sent uh, former President Obama to Pennsylvania mm -hmm. while she was in Arizona, and it was extraordinarily well-timed. Ballots went in the mail on Wednesday. Folks are going to be voting this weekend for her to pop over to Chandler, where she's going to have to have Republican crossover votes from that specific neighborhood, I think was a really good move. And, and Bear, what's your take on that? Do you think that Harris is risking spending too much time when she should be focusing on Pennsylvania and those things? Because I mean, the math gets really difficult for Democrats and for the Harris campaign if they can't uh, get yeah. Pennsylvania. Well, look, uh, uh, I think she has done both. She, uh, you know, first of all, we're going to get all four <coughs> principles here in a week. So the Trump campaign is not taking Arizona for granted. That's for sure. They still see it as competitive. They've sent both uh, Trump and Vance here uh, in the span of a week, much like Walls and Harris. And next week, I believe uh, Obama will be here uh, in Tucson, I believe. And so I, I think the campaigns are, you know, look, there's really only 
seven or eight states that they got to go to. Most of them are on the East Coast or, you know, Eastern time zone, Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, North Carolina, of course. So I, I think that both campaigns are spending, you know, the right time, though, I think Trump is also going to California, Colorado, and <laughs> and Madison Square Garden in New York. Not really sure how many new votes he's going to get at MSG, but or or for that matter, in California. And, and what what does Harris have to do? And I'll ask you too about the Trump campaign to close the deal here with Arizona voters in the final weeks of this campaign. I think she's doing exactly that, which is remind voters that she supports the women's right to choose. She brought the reproductive freedom bus to Arizona. She reminds voters what's on the line. And there is no way women in Arizona trust Donald Trump in their OBGYN's office. And so she continues to talk about abortion rights. She continues to talk about the economy. She's talking about the border crossings being down. I think she's doing exactly what she needs to do. Yeah, and what does Trump have to do to close the deal with voters here? Economy and immigration. Economy and immigration. No dogs. Economy <laughs> and immigration. If he keeps talking about the economy, uh, inflation, immigration, and our insecure border, he will attract more voters. It's when he goes off on the crazy stuff that he starts to lose people, but mm -hmm. if he stay, but his TV ads are well produced, right? And though, you know, I've seen a lot of TV ads on like uh, uh, transgender rights. I don't know if that really moves middle Those of the road. Those are the ones voters. in the heaviest rotation the heaviest when you start looking at this. Absolutely. And I'm not sure that that moves the independent, moderate voters. It certainly plays to the base, mm -hmm. but I don't know, you know. It's just not a big issue. Let me ask you, though, too, why do you think, you know, we, we high ground, we, Arizona's family commissioned a, a poll recently with High Ground that showed that Kamala Harris is doing much better with crossover appeal. She's not walking away with a bunch of Republican votes. We're talking about 12, 13 percent of Republicans crossing over to vote for her, whereas Donald Trump is getting uh, just over one, <laughs> two percent of those votes. Why is that? Uh, well, I think it's, uh, well, first of all, in some ways, I'm surprised it's not more, but, mm -hmm. you know, uh, unlike, you know, a lot of Republicans saw Biden in 2020 as someone they could, mm -hmm. you know, rely upon to be moderate and everything. They don't view Harris the same way. So they may have a problem with Trump, mm -hmm. but they also have a problem with Harris's policies. Mm -hmm. You know, they're Republicans. They're not liberals. They may dislike Trump a lot, but they're not sure that, that Harris isn't a bridge too far. Yeah, and so I, I think that is a problem that she does have to overcome to make up for some of the other areas where she lacks Hispanic men, African American men, and, and you know, we, uh, with abortion on the ballot, yep. and you just saying that they do not want Donald Trump in the doctor's office with them. <laughs> why is the race so close still in Arizona? Well, Arizona is. Uh, always has been an unpredictable mm -hmm. ticket splitting electorate, right? De it's Dennis, don't tell her. Arizona is a Republican state. Don't tell her that. Well, of course it is. I mean, that is the largest block of voters, but we keep winning. You have absolutely no statewide uh, uh, offices, my uh, man. Uh, Arizona, so we, uh, we Arizona continue, isn't a MAGA state. Well, what it we, is a conservative state, but not a MAGA state. What we continue to do is reject extremists. It yes, started in 2016, agreed. and those are coming from your party. So no, I, I, don't, I don't disagree. All right, I don't disagree. Once we get rid of the, the MAGA movement and go back to the normal business conservative Republicans, they will, start winning. All right. they will start winning. They will start winning. All right, we're going to have to put a pause here on this wonderful uh, segment of television right there. But we're going to be keeping the panel here to talk about the rest of this week's major headlines, including the congressional debate in District 6. That's next on Politics Unplugged. Welcome back to Politics Unplugged. Time to take a look at the rest of this week's p political headlines. Uh, Stacey and Barrett are still with us here. And before we start going into some of that stuff, I want to kind of circle back. I want to go back to yeah. uh, the Senate debate. And we got some big news this past week that the uh, divorce records for Ruben Gallego and his ex-wife, uh, Phoenix Mayor Kate Gallego, are apparently set to be unsealed uh, later this month, I believe on October 17th. Um, we don't know what's going to be in those, but let me ask you this. They have been fighting to keep them sealed. Is this a good look or a bad look for a Senate, for, for someone running for the U.S. Senate to try to keep these records sealed? Well, we don't know what's in there, right? And they continue to say that this is to protect their son. And I trust that to be mm -hmm. true. And so good parenting is good for the Senate, is good for either of their campaigns. We're talking about the mayor of the fifth largest city and a gentleman who's, who's at this point winning a U.S. Senate race. And so I, I think that's perfectly fine. And this, the TMZ nature of this mm -hmm. is clearly not going to cost Ruben the election. If that was the case, we would never have had a President Trump. 
Barrett, what do, you, what do you think about this? Well, look, I mean, is this the kind of thing that could change the dynamic of the race, um, maybe give people pause, like saying, what's he hiding? I mean, you know, there may be nothing in those uh, divorce records. There could be something in right. those. We no, just we, don't know. We don't know. But when, the, when you don't know, there's all sorts of speculation. Yep. Maybe it's a bad look. Yeah. No, it is, it is a bad look. Uh, I, I would say that, look, journalists, Stacy and I, as former journalists, we used to look at court records all the time, civil, criminal, family, to learn about people, you know, and what what a couple does in their marriage and it gets exposed through divorce records is important. I mean, I think we learned that there was an allegation, I believe from Marla Maples, one of, one of Trump's wives, that there was some sexual assault, right? And, People reported that. Mm -hmm. People, you know, talked about that a lot. I'm not saying that made a difference, and I'm certainly not saying that's anything like that in the Gallego mm -hmm. divorce record. I'm just saying divorce records are useful for the public to understand the candidate. They're salacious, right? It's I mean, salacious. Sure. Okay. I, I've been but married I mean that, 25 but that's years. It's about... under no circumstance would I want anyone looking into the worst days of my 25-year marriage. Mm -hmm. Like I, I don't fault them for wanting to keep those yeah, skills. I, I don't fault them for wanting to keep it safe. But we live in a society where. Generally, court records are open, Fair game, yeah. are, are public records. So, All right, All right. And before we move on to that, I think it's important to point out as well that uh, Kate Gallego has endorsed her ex-husband's campaign correct. in this cycle. So we don't know, but we do know that she has endorsed him on that. Now let's talk about that other that race down in uh, the congressional districts. This is one of those races, right, that could determine the balance of power in the House, it's Indeed. been it's been targeted by both Democrats and Republicans. Republicans want to keep that seat with Juan Siscomani. Um, Democrats think they can flip it. Yeah, Republicans see Juan Siscomani as a big rising star, and they are going all out to protect him, to promote him. And he, I think, has represented the Tucson area district pretty well. He is a moderate voice, so uh, you know. And as you know, Kirsten Engel is uh, has taken some liberal positions, defund the police, which in some parts of Tucson actually is how they feel. So um, I, this is a, a good rematch, and we've seen rematches before, right? Uh, uh, McSally won on her second or third try uh, against Barber. So mm -hmm. we have seen uh, rematches and, you know, a flipping of, uh, of the results. So I, I think it's the most exciting race in Arizona, for sure. Yeah, and this has been a, I mean, this is a district that has just flipped back and forth repeatedly yeah, right? over the years. It is a true swing district here. Um, what are you seeing in this race? Again, it seems like just like what we're seeing on the national level throughout the state, abortion, immigration. Yeah. Well, and that's exactly it. And Juan Siscomani has not supported a number of bipartisan pieces of legislation that would actually advance border <laughs> security, including Senator Sinema's bipartisan border bill. Well, it never got the, to the House. It never did right. get to the House. But it certainly wasn't, he certainly wasn't a champion. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think his record is going to be um, his biggest weakness. And t talk to us a little bit about the inside of these races. You've run congressional races. You, re you, you work with Debbie Lesko. Um, um, you know, we know that there was this debate, this debate recently. I don't know how many people watch it. How are these races and these congressional races won and lost? Is it like mail and pieces knocking on doors? Really, What's the it deal? It really is a ground game, uh -huh. uh, in a, even in a congressional district. It really is, you know, getting out there to the Rotary Clubs and, you know, greater Tucson people of the, of the world, whatever groups that they're out there, you know, pressing the flesh. Uh, in a congressional district, you can still do that. And I think Juan has done that well. I, mean, I think he is really focused on the district. All right, we got about uh, a little less than 30 seconds here. Who, how, how do you think this race, race shakes out? And, you know, again, it's got a lot of ramifications yeah. as, you know, people are, the parties are battling for control of the House. I think there are two pickups. I think we pick up the seat in Tucson and we pick up the seat uh, with a meat oh, shot. Both, oh, both that's, a bold. that's a I bold do. prediction. That's a bold you agree prediction. With that? Uh, I don't. Um, you know, I, I don't know that Amish Shah was the strongest candidate, and I think Schweiker probably nah. survives. All right, we're going to have to end it right there. That is all the time we have. But be sure to join us next week for more politics unplugged. Good night.